<clears throat> right, okay, so this is what we're gonna talk about today. Um, I'm basically gonna talk about three different ways of doing calibration, um, starting with, I guess, the most common form of first order calibration, uh, which is, we often call the ideal feed assumption based calibration. Uh, then I'm going to describe this idea of measurement equation modeling, where you, you track an unknown source over a range of parallactic angles and use that to determine both the Stokes parameters of the unknown source and the, Jones, the parameters that do describe the Jones matrix. And then finally, when you, when you have something that you can point to as a stabilized, stable polarized reference source, you can treat that as, an, as a known source and just do this. In the case of pulsars, you do this template matching where you're basically forcing the observed Stokes parameters to match the uh, polarized average profile. I'm gonna end with just a little bit of discussion about how to uh, maybe extend what we're doing or what we've been talking about to phased arrays. But in fact, I haven't done much research on that front myself. I, I've looked at the problem only briefly, but I, I, I guess I'll point in the direction of where I think this could go. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. Thank you for this. Right. So the, the first, first order calibration is um, basically you have some artificial source of polarized flux. And typically this is a noise diode that's, uh, you just run a current through it and it generates a signal, and then you somehow couple that signal equally to your two polarizations. So you can do this either by putting a little transmitting dipole into your feed horn and sending the signal on this little dipole. And if you orient that dipole at 45 degrees with respect to your X and Y axes, it should induce equal and opposite, or sorry, equal and in phase responses in each of your X and Y signal paths. How do you do it? How do you do a circular one? What does that look like? It would all, you could also do it with a linearly polarized uh, signal, but I think there it would generate... Uh, yeah. If one of your states is circular left and right, circularly polarized right, what is your equivalent of vertical and horizontal? Linear polarization for circular. What does it look like? Is it a little wire that's a circle or what? If you wanted to generate it, you could, uh, if you want to generate circularly polarized light, you can send it, send the electric signal up a helix, basically. Uh, so it's a, a helical antenna. Oh, right. yeah. Got this. Okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we don't have them. Uh, do we have them here? Yes. <laughs> uh, you can also, if you have um, linearly polarized uh, receptors, you can put the signals from one of them, or is it both of them, through it's something called a quarter wave plate, and that'll convert your oh, basis. Counts, yeah. Counts, yeah, but that's kind of a cheat way. You're not in inherently... Uh, receiving, I, I, well, yeah. maybe it's not a cheap way. I haven't worked with them very, very much, so I, I'm not too familiar with them. Yeah. Uh, so you can do that e either with a transmitter that injects or transmits into your feed horn, or or you could um, couple your signal to the wires immediately after your receiver. So after transduction. So transduction here is this conversion from a free space electromagnetic wave to a voltage on a wire. And then after you have that voltage on a wire, you can couple in some signal that it should be equal and in phase in both of those wires if it goes through a, a splitter and a pair of couplers. But that does not make sure that your receiver is perfectly non-elliptical. That's right, that's right. So this, in the second case, your Cal signal wouldn't be subjected to any cross coupling or whatever happens in, in the receiver in the feed horn, the electromagnetic response of the feed horn and the transduction waveguides. So they, there's a special data waveguide called an orthomode transducer, which separates the two polarizations out of the, of the incoming uh, wave field. 
So we're not going to focus too much on that, but we'll, we'll just say there is this artificial noise source that can be injected somehow. And then we make this ideal feed assumption where we say our, our receptors are orthogonal, so there's no cross coupling, and our noise diode illuminates or is coupled to each of them equally in both amplitude and phase. So it, it, even if the cross coupling isn't small or negligible, this first order calibration can often get you into the ballpark of the, the actual solution when you're doing a full, full modeling process. So this is actually still very, very useful, even if you're intending to do the full, uh, full calibration of the cross coupling. Uh, so in, if you have equal uh, signal in X and Y, that corresponds to like 100% correlation between X and Y, which is the Stokes U signal. So I represented that by that four vector here, which has one for the total intensity, zero for Stokes Q, one for Stokes U, and, and zero for Stokes V. And if we put that through, so up, up in the top row here is the Jones matrix for our ideal feed. So there's only terms on the diagonal. There's no off diagonal terms. We have a boost along the Stokes Q axis, which is the differential gain, and a rotation about the Stokes Q axis, which is the differential phase. And if you put, if we convert into Stokes, so we, we compute the identif identical Mueller matrix you'd see what it does is it has a little boost in the upper left hand two by two part of the four by four Mueller matrix and a rotation in the bottom right of the four by four Mueller matrix. So, uh, William, sorry, how do we see that the Jones matrix is, is diagonal from uh, here? Yeah, if I, if I had expanded it in its two by two form, mm -hmm. the boost along Q would give you a two by two matrix where on the diagonal in the upper left you would have e to the beta and in the bottom right corner you would have e to the minus beta so that was the okay. and the rotation about stokes q by phi would give you e to the i phi in the upper left hand corner and e to the i minus phi in the bottom bottom right hand corner okay so i mean it was not obvious from from here but that's how it should be. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So Q hat here corresponds to S, S1, if you will. And that's the first Pali matrix, which is diagonal, but with one and minus one uh, in the top, up left, upper left and bottom right. Uh, and then computing the equivalent Mueller matrix can be done using an equation that was uh, shown maybe a couple couple days ago. But basically, this is what the output Stokes parameters would look like. You'd have uh, the hyperbolic cosine uh, and sine for i and q, and then the cosine and sine of phi for u and v. So those two parameters can be estimated directly from the measured Stokes parameters, the, ta the hyperbolic tangent of two beta is just given by Stokes Q over the total intensity or S1 over S0. And likewise, the tangent of two phi is given by the ratio of Stokes V over Stokes U or, or S3 over S2. Um, the, the, uh, so MJ, um, MJ is defined as the, sorry, I cannot point out here. Yeah. Um, it's the Mueller matrix associated with that Jones matrix J. Okay. I could and write, uh, yeah. I could write it um, up on the board uh, if that helps to visualize it. So I'll stop the share. So ho hopefully now, um, let's see, so that, that Mueller matrix MJ, I won't show the full derivation, but basically it just looks like uh, hyperbolic the cosine on the diagonal and cosine two phi in this part of the diagonal. And then you get the sine two phi, sine two phi, and one of these is negative one two phi. <laughs> and hyperbolic sine beta and beta. And then everywhere else, uh, zeros. 
So the boost along Stokes Q doesn't affect Stokes U of E, and the rotation about Stokes Q doesn't affect Stokes Q or U of theta. We uh, we can control the boost, uh, but not exactly. There's all uh, so we try to design. For example, you think of these two signal paths going through separate sets of amplifiers and separate sets of filters, and we'll try to match those amplifiers and filters, but they'll have a unique spectral response. So as soon as we start it, we're not in control. Hey, Katarina. <laughs> Uh, she can see us. She can't see us. Yeah. For some reason, oh, unmute. Let's try that. Unmute audio. I was I was waving at Matthew. Ah, okay. <laughs> hey, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> now I can see you. <laughs> Sorry. Who else is online? Um, Willem, but the so what so the areas have <laughs> be back. <laughs> Viver is, is comfortable enough. So um, you were saying uh, that that in this in this case uh, the metric shows that if you have a boost along Q is not going to affect uh, like for example um, the, the 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 other stocks because uh, basically the upper right corner of the Mueller matrix is all zero. So I mean, are the quadrants? Uh, I I don't understand how we can understand if one is affecting the others actually. Uh, good good question. Maybe so. The, maybe the way to think of it conceptually from from a physical point of view is if you do a Lorentz transformation from one basis to another basis. Uh, vectors, so lengths that are perpendicular to the velocity vector, aren't contracted. There's no Lorentz contraction along x along the directions perpendicular to the velocity, and it's the same. I'm not, sure. I'm not sure if this is the way to understand it. <laughs> uh, uh, no, because another, here, yeah, sorry. Maybe another way to think of it is that Stokes U and V in the linear basis are formed by the cross correlation between um, x and y. So whatever gain terms you, you do to scale x and y, uh, Ah uh, well, okay. So perhaps uh, the so the upper left uh, quadrant of the Mueller matrix is only mixed in between them i and q, and uh, and vice versa. The the bottom right quarter, that is the one with phi, is actually mixing between them only q uh, or u and v. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was just thinking to say that when so. I'll, I'll write it up here, but um, u, uh, u plus i times v is related to, I think it's two times the expectation value of uh, uh, u i. Can you see that? Uh, so P, yeah. um, if we scale, we can take the, the scale factors out, and we could write that as um, some average of the amplitude of x and the amplitude of y, and a differential phase term that would be something like the phi y minus phi x, the instantaneous, the instantaneous phase of the signal. And you can scale x or y and change these amplitudes without changing that differential phase term. So you could say the orientation in uv doesn't change, but the length of the vector in the, in the uv plane can change. And uh, I, I think one thing I've left out here, I don't know. I think what I've left out is the, the factor G. So if we if we went back to the slides, yeah. So there's that 
um, big, I'll share again. Uh, oops. Am I still sharing my screen with you guys? Probably not. No. no. So if I go back to the slides. Uh, that top line there actually has a gain factor that comes out of this as well. And so I, one thing I didn't write here was the d squared. So any changing of the length of the vector in the UV plane comes out in that d squared term. But the, you could say the ratio of V on U doesn't change. So there's no rotation of um, the vector in the UV plane due, due to the boost part. Sorry. Does that help to answer your question? So you can, you can change the amplitudes of EX and EY, which comes out in the, gain, the overall gain of the transformation, but the direction of the vector in the UV plane isn't changed by the boost. It's one way of summarizing that. Okay, I, I think it makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so I've got here uh, some examples uh, from, from data. So this next slide here is just showing this noise diode, which is being uh, driven by a square wave that's being run into the noise diode. And then the signal is being uh, observed and folded over many periods of that square wave. And then in the end, we subtract the unpolarized uh, baseline or the, you could say the the system temperature, which in principle is unpolarized, and um, plot the just the Stokes parameters of the pulsed noise diode. This is in a single 500 kilohertz channel, uh, and we're just looking at the Stokes parameters in, again, RGB is Stokes Q, uh, U, and V, and then the black line at the top is the total intensity. And maybe what you'll see immediately, that this looks like a, f a fairly good balance in the gains. So there's no Stokes Q here. Stokes Q is pretty, pretty much zero. The red line is pretty much zero. Uh, so in that channel, at least, there seems to be a good balance between the, the gain in X and the gain in Y. But what we expect to be a purely green signal in Stokes U, there's a, um, well, it's negative instead of positive, and there's significant circular polarization, the, the blue line. So that's a sign of the differential phase in that channel. Uh, so if we plot these parameters over um, all of the frequency channels in this observation, so going from the bottom panel here, you see the absolute gain G. And this is just saying if the noise diode had a flux of one, um, then the gain of the system was this value. So the observed value of the, the noise diode was around you know, between 0.65 and 0.7. If we go to the previous plot in this channel, it looks like the noise diode was around 0.5. So I'm not sure where I, you know, I might have picked it from a strange place, <laughs> or maybe. Um, Phil, I'm sorry. In the in the previous one, uh, sh shouldn't have been uh, like Q um, equal to the total intensity theory. The this was a fully polarized uh, um, square wave, isn't it? Yeah. So. In principle, before this signal went through a, a transformation, let's say it was the exact Stokes U signal that we expected, we would have seen zero red Stokes mm -hmm. U, zero blue Stokes V, and the green, ah, okay. the green line would be on top of the black line. So it would be okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, perfect. Sorry, thanks. Uh, so if we, um, you know, so that absolute gain term G just comes out from the de determinant of the Jones matrix that, that, that is modeled. The gamma term there is just another way of talking about the differential gain. So it's expressing it as a percentage now. And so what you can see here is that when, when it goes negative, it's saying the amplification in the Y polarization was around 10% greater than the amplification in the X polarization. And then it goes back up towards zero and then a little bit above zero as you go up to around 1350 megahertz. So that's just due to the variation in the gains of these amplifiers and attenuators that were applied. When you look at the differential phase, the first thing you see is a, a line with a slope and it wraps at plus or minus 90 degrees, uh, again, because of that kind of spin one half uh, nature of the 
electric field basis. So th these angles are measured in the Stokes basis. So if you remember, um, if we go back a few slides, uh, that differential phase is phi computed down at the bottom. So it's the um, inverse tangent of V on U divided by two that gives you phi. And that's why it only goes between minus 90 and plus 90 as another way of saying that mathematically. The line here, uh, if you know your Fourier theory, you know that when one signal is shifted in the time domain, you end up with a phase gradient in the frequency domain. It, yeah, so that's what we're seeing here is that, that this, um, the X and Y signals have traveled through different path lengths. And from the slope of this line, you could- Say that again. The go, X, from, go from the Fourier thing till we see they come through different phase lengths. Yeah, yeah. So say, it, say, say that again, Willem. <laughs> so a shift in the time domain corresponds to a phase gradient in the frequency domain. So if you, um, I don't know if I'll write this exactly, but if I if I take the signal x and it um, if I have x of t, x three transforms x of e, and then I convert that to x of e minus tau, so I shift x in the time domain. I'll stop uh, sharing my slides just a second, sharing the screen so you can see the board. Um, so this is just saying going from x and the Fourier transform is x of big X of mu. If I shift x in the time domain, I get the same uh, Fourier transform multiplied by some phase gradient. Uh, it's probably like a two pi tau, something like that. You physicists can learn negative one. Right. <laughs> that th there may be a. It might be plus i. I can't remember it exactly. No, you're right. It's yeah. just that I was <laughs> Yeah. So that, so that, in phase, that's just a line with a slope of 2 pi tau. So when I um, delay one signal with respect to the other, the differential phase should also vary. Ah, there, there must be also a new here. So. Yeah. <laughs> So that, that line, that phase varies with frequency uh, linearly. Uh, I'll go back to sharing. So that's the, the linear phase gradient that we see here. And that, from the slope, you could compute tau. And from that delay, you could compute the length of cable that needs to be taken out of one of your signal paths. Oh, it's not closed. It's not wrapping. In this space. That's right, yeah. The x axis is just the frequency axis. This slope would continue out to beyond the, the band if we, if, we had, if, if we observed a wider band. So this is neat. We can measure these parameters very quickly using an observation of the noise diode and then just invert that and get back a little bit closer to um, what the actual Stokes parameters are. This um, is synthetic data, presumably. That line's very straight. No, that's, that's actual data, uh, and, it, and the error bars are actually that small. <laughs> uh, oh, they're not eyes. I thought they were letter I. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can confirm that that line is not that straight, but it's very, very close. To yeah, that. yeah. So it's often people will take out that slope and quote it as a single number, the, the delay, and then everything, you get to see the residual kinks and wiggles in that slope instead of uh, this line. The jump is just where it wraps from uh, plus 90 to minus 90. And the reason that's not 180 is just because of that um, factor of 2 that appears in this. This is mathematically. Where is it? Its position doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, will it? Yeah. Yeah, sorry, Willem. Just a quick question. Um, would, would the phase would the phase wrap more than once? Is that it can? Yeah. Uh, okay. So in the latest UWL observations, for example, that that line that that phase would wrap um, more than ten, but less than a hundred times. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I haven't I haven't counted the wraps. 
So this means, this implies basically a, a strong delay of the signal from one feed to the other. So if we have two, two feeds illuminated the same way, then one, and we have a, like two wraps. Yeah. Uh, one of the two signals is extraordinarily delayed with respect to the other. There's, there's that, and also the ultra wideband receiver just has a really wide bandwidth, so you see a lot, a lot of wraps, even, even for the same delay. But that, the, comp, the combined effect of observing over a wide band and pro probably an abnormally long cable length difference somewhere between the receiver and the digitizers um, led, led to that, yeah. All right. So what did you do? Yeah. Uh, can there be more than one one turn of phase in a channel? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that would it, it, if this if the step between your channels becomes sorry, if the step in phase between channels at your frequency resolution gets too large, then you'll get something called bandwidth depolarization. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you could say there's there's a you could you could probably express that. It probably involves Fresnel integrals or or some kind of sync function, but you could express what is the maximum amount of phase difference that I would allow to take place across my narrowest frequency channel and and what what is the maximum amount of depolarization that my experiment can accept. Yeah. <laughs> Or that that you can accept and still achieve your experimental goals. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm still somewhat wound by the fact that that line is so close to straight. Can you speak to that, please? Why, why is it so close? It shouldn't have numbers and numbers on that line. Like, really? It probably does. And if we if we took out that linear trend, you'd see the lumps and bumps uh, in the residual. But even so, compared to the plus or minus fifty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they would be uh, less than a degree, I would imagine, just looking at it. Yeah. Yeah, at least in terms of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is a small band, so we're looking at 40 megahertz of bandwidth here, ish. Maybe it's like 40. Well, I think it's small, so it's not making a big change across a small area of frequency. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. But so this is. Doesn't have to be more. I mean, this is driven by the physics of the interstellar medium. Yes, right? So you it's... can go up and then down. I mean, the real curve could be, and then the real curve could be a little bit more. This is it. Yeah. It... Oh, I see. Yeah. This is a characteristic of your input system with no noise. This is no noise, isn't it? There's, well, there's, no, <laughs> there's noise on top of it, but um, maybe the way to think of it is, so the first order effect that we see, the line, is due to the differential cable length or differential delay. And there, there would be a second order effect, something like the differential gain curve where you see some kinks there's and wiggles. No That's, That's right, there's no astrophysics. <laughs> yes. Okay, now I understand what's going on. Okay. I, I thought that that straight line was something like the extra phase length of the two polarizations going through the interstellar medium, but it's not. This is in the telescope. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Right. Yep. Right. You can you can create similar plots for Far that describe Faraday rotation, which is the differential delay. That's of, what I thought this one was. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was this. Yeah. This yep. is not. The, the upper figure should be the collection of points like the bottom ones. I think it is. I think it's lots of little dashes. Right? Pairs. Yeah, the, the the error bars are really small on this yeah, scale. Yeah. 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 Oh, maybe the maybe it's my. I think it's what it is. Yeah. That's why it looks like lines. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the say first order approximation to calibration, based on this ideal feed assumption. Uh, then the next step is to do something like, uh, well, I'm calling it measurement equation modeling. Sorry, and then you compensate physically, cable, or do you compensate? You can by yeah, you can you can patch in an extra length of cable, okay. yeah. yeah, or cut or cut some length out <laughs> if you want to yeah, yeah, yeah. make a new cable. Yeah. yeah. You can switch the bandwidth. You 
Yeah. Yeah. Sensitivity is proportional to the square root of the bandwidth, so we're always pushing for more more bandwidth. Yeah. But so if this differential phase was too great, um, you could just channelize at finer and finer uh, spectral resolution until. No, but you'd allow you to calibrate it uh, before the signal is depolarized. And if you do that correction in the frequency domain using Jones matrices, mm -hmm. you can then do an inverse Fourier transform and recover your, your temporal okay, resolution. That's once yeah, yeah, yeah. That would all be software. But the previous technique of cutting the cable, it's only one of the two that you've got two receptors here. So one of them that you've got. Yes. So yeah. You're changing the, you're changing the, the difference. difference in the yeah, yeah. That's right. So, so based on the slope, you. I, and I'm not sure which one. So maybe a positive slope you'd remove from X and a negative slope you'd remove from Y or something like that. And you could compute the amount of length that you should move. These are distinct pieces of wire. Yeah, yeah. You so, can actually hold this and cut it. Yeah, out of the receiver, there's two, two wires. Two, two coax cables come out of the receiver. It's not some mathematical combination on one wire. This is no. two actual bits of yeah, because you get yeah. an X and a Y feed now. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just two separate charges. Yep. Yeah. It's something of a revelation to me that there's an actual bit of metal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a physical. Yeah. You might have an accident. Yeah. Yeah. We're not talking. We're not talking abstract mathematical spaces anymore. Yeah. All right. So uh, this this idea of measurement equation modeling is really uh, based on this idea that even though your polarized source is unknown, if you observe it over a range of parallactic angles, so the parallactic angle is just the rotation of your receiver with respect to the celestial sphere, um, you can model those variations and get a handle on what your, what your instrument is doing, a better handle than just the ideal feed assumption. Um, and in, pulsars are interesting because each phase bin provides a, a unique polarization state. Uh, so they phase of the pulsar. Yeah, so if you think of phase as pulsar longitude, and we think of that kind of heartbeat-like response of the pulsar, every one of those phases can be used as a, as a unique polarization state, because the polarization is varying as a function of pulse phase. The ro rotational phases. Rotational phase, yeah, yeah. So the spin, you could say the spin phase of the... But your bins are still wide compared to your frequency of your bias. The the bins are wide. They're they're they're, sp they're in time the time domain. Those phase bins, yeah. But even so, the, the phase bins are big enough for you to be able to say it's in steady state. Over that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can say you can prove that in a kind of Nyquist way, where if you take the Fourier transform of the pulse profile, you'll see that all the signal dies out past a certain harmonic, and then it's just a white noise for. So we're going to start this measurement equation modeling procedure with no assumptions. So we're going to say the receptors are non-orthogonal, there's cross-coupling in the Jones matrix, and the noise diode does not necessarily illuminate or couple to the receptors equally. So we can actually um, include in this model variations away from that first assumption that the Stokes parameters of the noise diode or the artificial reference source are 1, 0, 1, 0. So we don't, no longer have to assume that. Uh, and this is just a plot. So this is one pulsar phase bin in one of these 500 kilohertz channels over a course of hours, probably some of the order eight or 10 hours. So the parallactic angle or the rotation with respect to this celestial sphere varied from minus 100 degrees to plus 100 degrees. So that's pretty much going from horizon to horizon on this source. This would have been 0437 minus 4715. So its declination is minus 47. And Parks is at minus 33. So it gets about 14 degrees away from it's like watching Zenith. the sun, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So you're watching the sun, and you're telling me that as I'm watching it, something is rotating with respect to something. Yeah, the way to picture it is I, I'm a telescope, and I can um, move my receiver in uh, Zenith and azimuth. 
And so if I start over here, I've got, uh, with respect to the sky, you can say my thumb is pointing north and my finger is pointing west. Show it to us too. <laughs> Sorry? I said show it to us too. Okay. <laughs> So if, really? the sun, if you can see the north pole of the sun, that will be rotating to, as you watch. That's what you're telling me, isn't it? Yeah. You, oh, so the, look, the receiver is rotating. The moon. Is this right? Uh, the moon is kind of making you super too big. Oh, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> but what, watch my thumb, it's the key thing. So here my thumb is pointing north, and as I follow the source along the sky, my thumb is pointing east, and now it's pointing south, and now I track that source down to the horizon. Because I, I can't rotate my wrist. I can only rotate <laughs> at the hip, and I can only rotate at the shoulder. Did you catch that on, on that end, Vivek? <laughs> yes, thank you. All right. It's just as Tim says, if you look, think about constellations rather than the point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Nice. Um, so in principle, you can uh, do this. And one thing that really tripped me up, and this was maybe what got me thinking about Hessian matrices and are they invertible and how is my nonlinear least squares algorithm working, is when I first coded this up, it didn't work. And it took quite a bit of head scratching to um, understand that there isn't actually a unique solution to this problem. Uh, and the problem is kind of summarized on this slide here. So the observed Stokes parameters, S prime, are equal to some Mueller matrix. This is the unknown Mueller matrix that describes my instrument. And I can parameterize it with those seven degrees of freedom that we talked about. And then in between the instrument and the source, S on the far right side, which is also... The, 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 sorry, the Mueller matrix was not parameterized by seven, three. Is, no, okay. no, but I'm, let's say this is a Mueller matrix derived from a Jones matrix. Oh, okay, okay, sorry, 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 sorry for it. No, no, that's good. Uh, and then on the far right, you have the Stokes parameters of the source, the intrinsic Stokes parameters coming from the pulsar, but also unknown. So both M and S in this upper equation are unknown. The only thing I know is this parallactic angle psi, which I can compute from geometry, and I know it's a rotation about the Stokes V axis, the line of sight. So that's my constraint. And the, the problem here, I'm making an analogy on the second line down where I say, compare this to trying to model X and Y, X times Y is equal to some constant. There's no unique solution there, right? This describes a, a line or a curve in space. Whatever I multiply by X and divide, by y, divide Y by the same number, I'll end up with the same constant. So the, the problem here is to think, is there uh, some thing that I can multiply by M and divide by S to end up with the same solution? And the, the answer is that that's possible uh, if I imagine some unknown transformation. So the big capital U on the, if you look at the block of four equations in the bottom, on the second row down in that block, I've introduced this unknown matrix U and I've given it the subscript V and I've, so I'm multiplying M, the Mueller matrix on the right by this, the inverse of this matrix. And I'm multiplying the Stokes parameters on the left by, the, by that matrix, this unknown parameter. And if I plug M superscript U and S superscript U back into this equation, because I've chosen U uh, subscript V. I'm, I'm saying U is an, a matrix that will commute with a rotation about the Stokes V axis. And because it commutes, I can just swap it, swap it over uh, and multiply it by its inverse and it disappears. So basically the unconstrained part of this equation is any matrix that commutes with a rotation about the Stokes V axis. And we've seen before, that's any matrix that has components. If you, if you break it down into that axis angle parameterization or you write it as a sum of 
uh, a linear combination of those basis matrices is the vector part of that sum, the three vector part of that four vector is parallel to the Stokes V axis, then it, then it will commute with that rotation matrix. So that U sub V uh, can be polar decomposed into a boost along the Stokes V axis and a rotation about the Stokes V axis. And that kind of makes sense uh, conceptually. If I, if I say, well, I don't know the position angle of my source, if I, you know, if I fi fix it and then fix it to some values and fix my receiver to some values, I can uh, rotate the source by some angle and rotate my receiver by that same angle and still end up with uh, the, same, the same response, the same, the same solution. So that, that's, that's the nut, the kernel of the problem, but it took me a long time to get to the bottom of that. I, I did a lot of software, software debugging along the way. What analogy is U force problem be appropriate? In this case, U matrix would be a regularization functional that we use in U force problems. What, what's that word? Sorry, the. the <laughs> U pose. Ill pose, yeah, 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 yeah. And U is like regularization functional, which is something unknown with multiplying. Yeah, I think I think that's one way. In in this kind of multi-dimensional space, this U would parameterize some cur curve in that space. So yeah. Two degrees of freedom at the bottom and top is that right? Because U has a well-defined local maximum. In the, the bottom line, there. The bottom line. Or the thing that you're trying to optimize. The, the, the right hand side of the bottom. The bottommost line is basically just expressing the fact that U commutes with this rotation matrix. And that's why, so I'm basically saying U, U, UV and RV commute. And that's why, it, this, that's why this uh, unknown matrix can enter into the problem and, and uh, give you another solution that you have a different Mueller matrix, M superscript U, and a different source Stokes parameters, S superscript U, but they still satisfy the, the equation such that you, you get the same observed Stokes parameters. But you've reduced your optimization problem to a more specific one because you've got this extra U matrix to play with. So you can place a constraint on either N or S. But uh, it, it kind of it goes kind of goes the other way around. So now now that I know that I can't constrain the components of the U matrix, I have to somehow constrain them. And the way to do that is with um, an additional assumption <laughs> and possibly some additional constraints. So to constrain the unknown rotation about this Stokes V axis, I basically just set the orientation of one of the receptors in the model to zero and say, this is my reference, reference orientation. And therefore the orientation of the other receptor would parameterize the non-orthogonality of the receptors. And to constrain the boost along the Stokes V axis, so remember boosts mix total intensity. So that's basically saying, I have no idea what Stokes V of my source is or how much my instrument is boosting and mixing Stokes I and Stokes V. Uh, and to, to constrain that, you can take in another source that you consider to have negligible circular polarization and say, well, at least this source has zero Stokes V. So now I can lock down um, the, the boost parameter. Um, because sorry, so I'm not sure if I I'm not sure if I'm understanding correctly. So in the in the previous in the previous slide, um, okay. So the the upper one is basically telling us how, even uh, okay, how our, our unconstrained system is seeing uh, um, an incoming radiation that is uh, S prime from S that is the astrophysical one. And then you're saying, okay, given that we don't know nor M nor S, uh, so we know RV, I guess. Yep. Um, so this, this problem is unconstrained. And then uh, and the, the, the bottom part you are showing uh, why it is, where, where is it, where it is unconstrained. So UV is, um, um, is the matrix that describes, no, it's not a matrix, sorry. It is a two by, um, or it, in this case, it's a four by four Mueller matrix that characterizes our ignorance. Yeah. Okay. Or another, okay. Way, 
or the, characterizes what remains unconstrained by this equation. And the, the one way of reading those four lines in the bottom is saying, um, if, if M and S, as given in the topmost equation, solve this, solve this equation, then so do MU and SU, where MU and SU are defined as on the next two lines, so long as U commutes with R. Always been baffled by that. What is the position on two matrices? Well, it's kind of Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Nowhere is it more sharp. Yeah. You've got a nice, nice answer. <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, so. Okay. Sorry. Basically, you can picture this UV as something that swims to either side of that R and causes problems. <laughs> and it can do that because it commutes with R. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, so our our uh, um, the, the the fact that this is a non-constrained problem depends only on the fact that you this this U matrix commutate with R. Yep, yep. So we had this dream we were going to constrain all seven parameters of the Jones mm -hmm. matrix, but there's two that we can't constrain given only observations of an unknown source as a function of parallactic angle. Okay. There remain two degrees of freedom that we can't constrain, given those, given only those observations. If it, if it is unknown, that's right. So sorry, Anthony. Then it's like that. yeah, yeah. Then it's all all better. <laughs> yeah. Like we use this for the unknown source. If we get these parameters for known source, can we extrapolate or project them to whatever useful? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll show that. I'll show that next, actually. Uh, so basically, we make these two assumptions, and then we can measure these extra parameters. So now we have, starting from the bottom again, we have the absolute gain term that just says how everything is scaled, the differential gain term that just says how x is amplified with respect to y. The differential phase, so we still see that linear gradient in the third panel up. And then the fourth panel up shows the ellipticities of the receptors. And these are five, five degrees in electric field space, which makes them about 10 degrees in Stokes space. So it's a, it's a 10, 10 degree rotation about the Stokes U axis that mixes Stokes Q and V. So it makes your linear polarization look circular and uh, you, you can rotate circular into linear. And then the uppermost plot is just the orientation of receptor one, where the orientation of receptor zero is hard set to zero uh, because we can't constrain uh, the absolute rotation of the receiver. So those are the uh, six parameters that we, we can constrain. And the only reason we were able to constrain the, the other one was because I've added here in, uh, in the background, I've added observations of a source that is considered to have very little circular polarization. So that became my. So this um, is real. Yeah, yeah. So these, yeah, yeah. So this is a fit. Again, it's a fit to uh, <coughs> curves like these ones, but with some additional constraints added in addition to these curves. Basically, we pointed the telescope at Hydra A, which is a really bright, um, active galactic nuclei, nucleus, and. Uh, um, their previous observations of that source say it has maybe like 0.5% circular polarization or maybe even 0.05 or something like that. So I said, okay, while we're pointing at that source, I'll say any circular polarization that I observe is due, due to the instrument, the, the, this mixing between Stokes I and, and Stokes V. Um, I actually did it in a kind of lazy way and I'll come back to that. <laughs> uh, a wobble on theta one as a function of frequency. I mean, if that's an absolute angle, shouldn't it be independent? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. So that you wouldn't expect 
if it was just a rotation, a physical rotation of one receptor with respect to the other, you wouldn't expect it to vary with, with frequency at all. We're, we're talking about the topmost panel now. And I, I think that means it's not a real rotation, it's just cross coupling between the, um, the feeds, or be, sorry, between the receptors that um, looks like a rotation. Uh, and, that, that, and that's possible, right? Because cross coupling is just introducing off diagonal terms. So it's not, it's not uh, no, there's structure in there. Yeah, yeah. So th I would say that that's an electronic phase uh, or uh, an electronic effect, so something in the electromagnetic response of the feed horn, or in the um, possibly even cross coupling after after the feed horn. For example, if the amplifiers were close together, could could lead to that. Yeah, that's just to differentiate um, receptor one, sorry, receptor zero in black and receptor one in red. Yeah. And the other plots are all black. Yeah. yeah. The, the other plots you could say the, are, com they describe the combinations of the receptors. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is a bit of laziness. Uh, so since 2004, um, so what, what I did when, when, I'm, when I first coded this up it, to incorporate these observations of Hydra A, so this is talking about the bottom line on this screen here. Um, I basically just took the on source observations and thought Hydra is so bright, it will kind of dominate to first order the response. And that really isn't quite a good, quite, quite accurate. There, there, there could be, um, let's say the system temperature is quite bright and it could have a significant amount of circular polarization in it. Uh, and that problem kind of bit some colleagues down the road. Uh, what, so the code had this kind of built in and some colleagues were applying this. So if you look at this paper by Liao et al, uh, 2016, they showed um, if you just used the PS archive tools and calibrated another um, uh, source, like a, one of these uh, 3C sources, the circular polarization that you get out of that solution is the line shown in blue there. So a mean value of about two Kelvins, and I think they say these these sources are, you know, fifty to fifty eight to seventy two Kelvin. So it's a, you know it's a significant fraction. It's a, a, between one and two percent. Yeah. No, Sorry, I'm, yeah. I, I'm playing truth. Yeah. No problem. See you, Robin. Uh, so what they. The green line shows what they did to correct that. So they observed a bunch of quasars, and uh, instead of just using the on-source observations, they, they did on-source and off-source observations and subtracted the difference to try and take out the instrumental effect and leave just the flux of the quasar, which is really what I should have done, but I, but I didn't. So now that... that but uh, sorry, William. So, so the, um, the 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 people from the 2016 paper, uh, the problem that they had was that they observed the source with the, um, um, with 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 a significant Stokes V. Uh, in in all of the cases, the the quasars that they were observing should have had very little circular polarization. Yeah, yeah. So the observed blue line here is erroneous circular polarization left in the calibrated Stokes parameters of the quasar. Whereas when they observed a bunch of quasars and did this on minus off subtraction, which gives you um, a, be a better look at the flux of the quasar and subtracts all the system temperature and sky temperature and things like that. Um, and then they call it the e, min e sub minus correction. So when they applied that correction to the calibration model, then they got the green line, which shows very little circular polarization in the source. But still, sorry, I'm, I, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm missing something. So I, I haven't understood what they did wrong, honestly. Let's say the, the blue line is quasar calibrated using only PS archive and, and observations okay. of a pulsar. Okay. And then they said, well, there's obviously a problem here. So they, they took that as the first order model and then uh, so the, the main thing that's unconstrained, I, I chose one assumption, or I made one assumption to constrain the mixing between Stokes I and Stokes V. And I think 
it worked only because at parks there was very little circular polarization intrinsic to the system temperature, the system noise. But at GBT, the system temperature has circular polarization like you see in the, these blue curves. That's, that's like uh, just something that's coming out of the GBT, whether you're pointing at cold sky or, or, or a bright unpolarized source. The GBT receiver, the 800 megahertz receiver that they were using, mm -hmm. producing this circular polarization. And so that kind of breaks the assumption that I made, which said, ah, uh, if I'm pointing at a quasar and it's just a bit of, there's a tiny bit of circular polarization due to okay. but, it, but I can ignore it. Um, it, it that assumption fails dramatically on, on GBT. I see, okay. So to correct that, they observed a bunch of quasars and in, in, instead of just using the on, while I'm pointing at the quasar, this is the Stokes parameters. They also pointed off the quasar and subtracted that to get a better handle on the actual circular polarization from, from just the quasar, which should be close to zero. And then when they derived that correction factor and applied it to the calibration model, and then did another observation of this quasar or applied that calibration model to the same observations, they get the zero zero circular polarization that they expect, which is the green line. Because in this case, in this case the, um, because you were saying that the, this, this was for an unknown source, so, so the, uh, one, one, of the, one of the, let's say, problematic point is that initially it was, this, this, this algorithm was designed to work with unknown sources. So here in this case, they didn't know what, what were exactly the original Stokes parameters of the agents that they used also? I think most of them, they, they knew they had very little mm. intrinsic circular polarization. Okay. And so they were good sources to use as a constraint on this mixing between Stokes I and Stokes E. Okay. And also they averaged over many quasars. So even if the quasars had a little bit of circular polarization, their, their average should have even less, assuming that some are some are circular, left-handed circular, some have a little bit of right-handed circular. So I think that was, that's what gives them this excellent green line result. Uh, so it took me some time, uh, only this year, I updated the code so that the, the PCM code now can use both the on-source and off-source observations of a flux calibrator like Hydra A or whatever, and subtract those to give you a better estimate of a source with uh, zero or very little Stokes V. So you can constrain this mixing between Stokes I and Stokes V. Um, and one other update was just, so the first model that was implemented in PCM assumed that the noise diode was transmitted into the feed horn. The noise diode signal was transmitted into the feed horn and therefore it went through the cross coupling, the same cross coupling that the pulsar signal or the astronomy signal went through. And that the code's just been updated now to model systems where the noise diode signal is coupled after transduction. And basically that just means the noise diode signal is accepted or subjected only to the ideal feed and not to the cross coupling transformation that to which the the pulsar signal or astronomy signal is subjected. So there's a couple, couple of up updates just made in the last year, mostly in response to calibrating at Meerkat and calibrating on the UWL at Parks, um, both of which couple the noise diode after transduction. We're kind of kind of going over time. I was going to talk a little bit about how this idea where now you have a polarized source that you know its polarization. And if, if you observe a known polarized source, then you don't have to make any of these assumptions. None of these ideal feed assumptions, you don't have to incorporate any additional, additional constraints to constrain these degenerate parameters owing to the commutativity of, the, of that unknown <laughs> part of your Mueller matrix. You don't have to observe over a wide variety of paralactic angles. Um, so basically you just, if you have a pulsar that is well calibrated, you can treat it like a polarized reference source, take a single observation of it, and from that snapshot, get an, an estimate of your Jones matrix uh, as a function of frequency. 
And that's basically what's shown here. So now you see all seven degrees of freedom of the Jones matrix. Um, so again, gain, going from the bottom, gain, differential gain, differential phase, ellipticities of the receptors, and orientations of the receptors. Uh, the nice thing is once you do that, uh, you can take these snapshots wherever, whenever you observe that pulsar, you can take one of these snapshots. So this is showing a seven year history of the multi-beam receiver and how two of these non-orthogonality parameters vary as a function of time. So on the bottom panel is delta epsilon, so the difference, that the, the component of the receptor ellipticities that makes them non-orthogonal. And the upper panel is delta theta, which is the, their kind of orientation, the part of their orientation that makes them non-orthogonal. And you can see that, so the, the strips of, the two big strips of white are just where this receiver was taken down for maintenance. So after the second maintenance period, you can see the performance has become quite variable. It almost looks turbulent and random. Uh, so whatever, yeah, whatever happened during that maintenance, something got broken. And I think it's gone away since then. So these data end, I think in 20, 2013 or something like that. Uh, so that's pretty much everything I was going to say about single dish. Can I just ask, yeah. Let's assume you've got things like pointing to Yeah. Is that not really it, it, if the pointing errors are large, then you're going to get off axis polarization effects. So yeah. there's things like beam squint and there's, um, there's other words that I can't remember, but, but basically the, the, the response of the instrument varies off axis. But you would just use the, Calibrate the pointing right? Well, yeah, it is. I think it is the the pointing is mostly calibrated based on Stokes I. But last last night I heard a good idea from uh, Thomas at, on the Meerkat meeting. He's like, maybe we could use because if the polarization is more sensitive to these changes than Stokes I, maybe maybe the polarization response should be used to calibrate the pointing. It's a, it's more accurate. Yeah, it's a neat idea. Yeah. If you go on on source and on source, everything will be, or it will be the same. Like um, you can you can tell that like if you, it's it's only on source, right? Every, everything that I've been showing so far is on the on the bore site. Um, if you if you look at the Liao yeah, et al. paper. Yeah, these guys kind of go one step further, and instead of just having on and off, they do multiple traces uh, through the through the beam. Uh, they call them spider scans or something like that, and then they kind of map out the polarized response because they were quite interested in the full beam integrated response. Yeah, it's a it's a really good paper. This Liao et al. paper, if you have a look look around for it. I think I think I've put the link, the ADS link, in the notes on on the PowerPoint. Um, we could wrap up here and maybe talk a little bit about phase arrays tomorrow before doing the practicum then.